Muy buenos días a todos. Eh, Ushi, eh, thank you very much to be today with us. Eh, quiero, quiero simplemente referirme, más allá de darle las gracias a Uchi de estar con nosotros, quiero referirme al sentido de estos encuentros que ya comenzamos eh, con la anterior participación de Uchi en, en nuestro centro. Mi interés personal como director del centro y el interés nuestro es eh, abrirnos a, a la comprensión de un inmenso continente al cual con poca frecuencia nos acercamos, al menos es mi impresión, en el mundo académico, en el mundo filosófico, eh, argentino, al menos, que es África. Estamos más eh, acostumbrados, tenemos más tendencia a mirar o a los Estados Unidos o a mirar a Europa, y yo creo que tenemos mucho en común con África en cuanto a los problemas, en cuanto a las historias y tenemos mucho que, que compartir entre ambos, tenemos mucho que aprender de la experiencia y de la sabiduría africana porque eh, a pesar de, de los procesos de colonización que fueron dramáticos, tanto en, en, durante la colonia y después de la colonia, <coughs> eh, África ha sabido conservar eh, tradiciones ancestrales y como se ve en la obra de Ushi, de dialogar, de poner en diálogo el, la reflexión filosófica como talante filosófico, como, como modo de pensar con esas tradiciones. Y yo creo que allí hay mucho para aprender. Y, y, y yo estoy particularmente interesado desde hace mucho tiempo en, en promover ese, ese diálogo eh, entre nosotros y África. Por, por suerte tenemos una, hay una pequeña editorial nueva en Argentina que está editando específicamente literatura africana. Eh, en, 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 por ejemplo, se ha editado este, eh, La Mujer Descalza. Yo estoy leyendo ahora eh, otra, otros cuentos. Y bueno, hay, hay, tenemos acceso la posibilidad de tener acceso a esa, a esa literatura que habla también de esos de los procesos de colonización y postcoloniales, de esa, de esa historia y entrecruzamiento de, de, de civilización en el peor de los sentidos. Eh, por eso le quiero agradecer a Uchi la generosidad de acompañarnos y de ayudarnos en este en esta tarea que es un esfuerzo en el sentido que hay que promover el interés en Argentina de conocer y de dialogar eh, con África. De modo que, Uchi, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a ustedes y seguramente muchos podrán escuchar y ver esta conferencia en su grabación. Gracias a Liliana y su equipo. Gracias a a Marina y a Laura que han hecho posible este, este encuentro. Nada más. Thank you, Carlos. Eh, ano, eh, Uche. We are thrilled to have you here, as Carlos said. A ver si ahora estoy grabando.
Um, it's a real privilege to have you back. You were in charge of closing our academic year last year, and we will have the chance to listen to you twice this year, today and on December the 2nd, talking about the hermeneutics of hope in African ontology, right? Metaphysics. Uh, so this is a great effort on your part, on your generosity, on sharing part of your, your knowledge with us. As Carlos said, we have a lot to learn from your culture. Uh, well, I will introduce you formally now. Yes. Uh, Professor Stanley Uche Anozzi teaches philosophy, the person and social responsibility at Boston College, Jesuit University, Massachusetts, USA. He's a Boston College Pulse program faculty member. He taught philosophy and ethics at University of Indianapolis, Indianapolis, I'm sorry, Indiana, USA. He taught indigenous religions in global contexts at Carleton University, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Anotzi is a co-op director of alternative perspectives and global concerns, an Ottawa-based scholarly organization and a consultative status organization with UN ECOSOC, UN Committee of the States on NGOs, UNESCO. He was a contributor to Canada and Challenges of International Development and Globalization, a book nominated finalist for 2019 Prose Award by Association of American Publishers, Professional and Scholarly Publishing Division. Okay, Uche is going to, Uche Anotzi is going to talk today about advancing an African cosmopolitanism and political philosophy of patriotism. Thank you, Anotzi, the floor is yours. Right, thank you, Marina. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Liliana, and every other person. Uh, Buenos dias. I would like to share my screen and then take it off from there. Are you able to see? All right, perfect. Yes, very well. Yes. Just give me a moment. Then. All right, I would like to begin by making reference to some of the points underscored by Professor Carlos. It is an opportunity, it is a thing of joy to be able to do this presentation. It has not been very easy to publish works in African philosophy, like you may know, even African theology as the case may be, except within the colonial sense, promotion of Western narrative in relation to Christianity. So it's always a challenge to find publishers to get the ideas out there. And I do think there is a colonization of knowledge, colonization of philosophy, which does not really allow for the advancement of the philosophical views or the world views of people from other parts of the world. But I'm really excited. There is a level of progress in terms of equity, inclusivity, and diversity in some of the various departments and universities in relation to humanities and understanding other people, other worldviews, in terms of what reality is and how reality is appreciated, comprehended, and explained. In today's presentation, my project is to advance the hermeneutics on African cosmopolitanism and political philosophy of patriotism. There are two things going on here to advance. In other words, my intention is to consciously promote 
consciously promote. I think, you know, borrowing a little bit of the Spanish expression, conscientia critica, critical consciousness in promoting in advance Puritanism. That is number one. The number two aspect is the humanetics of the political philosophy of patriotism. They are two sides of one coin, as they say in English language, the two sides of one coin. You need both. The humanetics of African cosmopolitanism, one, and then the humanetics of political philosophy of patriotism, two. By way of introduction, I would like to put it this way, how is the humanetics of African cosmopolitanism and political philosophy of patriotism, how is it understood and applied in this presentation? Like I have presented in the past, especially in my work on Hans Georg Gadamer and African humanistic philosophy, it is my authentic understanding that the philosophy of the African people should be disseminated, should be expressed through humanetics, which is a, a system of interpretation, a system of communication, a system or tool of understanding the other, being able to listen to the other. In other words, it is my intention to take philosophy away from total abstraction that is associated with Western philosophy. You may call that the philosophy that is anchored on abstraction and uh, idealism, as well as a kind of hierarchy and superiority. The thing that is out there, that is untouchable, that is superior, that cannot be understood. But philosophy is a way of life for the African people. It's about their experience of the world and their encounter of one another. And so it's not based on abstraction. It is based on humanetics, it's based on dialogue, it's based on the dialectics, it's based on the philosophy of encounter, it's based on the philosophy of living with, being and being with the other. And so it is technically a philosophy of brotherhood and sisterhood. And so this is why I have captioned this part of this reflection today to be the humanetics of African cosmopolitanism. The interpretation, the articulation, the communication of the meaningfulness in terms of what it means to be a person within the African world and to live in the world as a person. I would like to move this forward. For us to really comprehend or to appreciate what is going on here, we have to go to the basic of the society. And the basic of the society is the person. Like they say in sociology, the person is the basic unit of the society. I'm using the same expression here or the same understanding. You can't really have a community of human beings without recognizing that the human beings as the constitutive element, the basic element that defines or instantiates the possibilities of a community. You can't really have a community without a person. And the person is not truly a person without the community. So both are mutually inclusive, both are mutually supportive of one another. There's a sense of symbiosis, a symbiotic relationship. They are not mutually exclusive. They should not be seen as against one another. And so to really progress, I would like to advance this reflection by moving from the known to the unknown, because this is very important in humanetics, especially within the tradition of Heinz Georg Gadamer, the tradition of Seni Serequ Behan, the tradition that I, I am inclined to as an avant God.
before now, the common conception or understanding of a person, especially from the tradition of Western philosophy, promoted and projected by someone, the French philosopher René Descartes. The idea of a person is the idea of a spiritual substance. The idea of a rational being, the idea of an intellectual being. In Rene Descartes' philosophy, as we may recall, he talks about the person as, from the perspective of, I think, therefore I am. In other words, to be is to be a thinking being. Thinking, rationality, intelligence is essentially at the core of what it means to be a human person. Or even within a Western tradition, to be an individual. A friend of mine was trying to express the philosophy of person of Rene Descartes in this way, which I think is a little bit funny, but there is a point there. I think, ego cogito, I think, not just therefore I am, I think, therefore I am awake. Because when you are thinking, then you have to be awake. But I would like to move on here. The point is, again, that for René Descartes, the thinking, the spiritual substance, res cogitant is more important than res extensa. The res cogitant, the thinking self, the thinking being, is the primary element that defines a human person. Without the thinking thing, without thought, without reason, without ratio, then you are not human enough. That is the implication. So you could extend this challenge to, what about being babies? Are babies considered to be human beings or human persons? Because they lack at that level, the capacity to think like a rational adult. And so that is a serious challenge there. We may also relate this to the, pro the problems of people in permanent vegetative state or in comatose situation or people who are experiencing Alzheimer's disease. Does that mean that they are not human beings? They are not human persons. I know within the context of being a baby, especially within the philosophy of Aristotle, they have, so to say, the potentiality, potentia, power, the faculty of becoming person that needs to kind of develop or that needs to kind of grow, so to say, in order to say, to call them human beings. But this is quite problematic. Now let's go a little bit to someone like Immanuel Kant. The German philosopher Immanuel Kant also was influenced by this tradition of looking at the human person from the perspective of intelligence, from the perspective of rationality, or what he called the principle of reason, rationality. To be a moral agent, you have to be a thinking being, a being that is capable of understanding the universal moral principles, that they are like mathematical ideas. And like women know, in Immanuel Kant's deontological ethics, morality is about what is right and what is wrong. So you have to be a thinking being to be able to discern and understand or comprehend the good that has to be done at all times and the bad or the evil that must be avoided at all times. So there are no middle grounds because intelligence or reason or rationality gets to the universal concepts, gets to the universal principles, gets to the universal framework that rules the world or determines morality in the world. Again, that frame of mind uh, is problematic in relation to the consideration of babies as rational agents or moral agents as well. 
Is it just at the level of potentiality, something that you have to look up to in future? And then that could also be applied to the idea of people who are experiencing dementia or Alzheimer's disease. Are they not capable of moral agency, especially within the tradition of Immanuel Kant? Like we may know about Immanuel Kant's expression or communication of the idea of morality in relation to understanding the human person, he had other principles, the principle of universalizability, because reason can be universalized to all human beings, then it should be the common denominator, the common basis for the possibility of morality within the human family. He also talks about the principle of autonomy because of rationality, the capacity to think, the capacity of intelligence or the intellect, there we are able to express ourselves in terms of freedom, freedom to think and freedom to do. Freedom associated with thought, which is also the idea of free will, to will the good at all times without any interior coercion or external coercion. Of course, there are many good things in relation to the philosophy of personal morality of Immanuel Kant, but we could see the problems there and hopefully during our discussions, we'll get to talk about that. Another principle by Immanuel Kant that is very interesting is the principle of humanity that each person is an end in itself especially in his idea of the community, that the person is an end in itself, not a means to a higher end, a higher purpose. And so we, in a moral world, would develop what he calls the kingdom of ends. We, are, we have this quality of rationality, the quality of humanity, and the quality of human dignity and human respect, as the case may be. Again, my point is to underscore that within the Western philosophical tradition, the emphasis was on rationality. The emphasis was on reason. The emphasis was on the power to think. To be a person is strictly so to be a thinking being, a thinking thought. Now, the next person that I would like to talk about in relation to understanding Western philosophy is Jacques Maritain. I'm just going to be very brief here because I would like to push this discussion forward. And so Jacques Maritain, he talks about the human person also from this intellectual substance and the material substance. He even went forward to talk about it in this sense. He talks about the spiritual side as well as the material side. He talks about it in relation to be a person is part of the spiritual dimension. And then to be an individual is part of the material dimension. And so for him, and we have to give credit to Jacques Maritain, both sides are very important in understanding the person. So the spiritual self, the spiritual self or the spiritual side is the person. The material side, the body corpus is the individual. And so that resonates with the ancient Greek philosophy of Aristotle, the Hulemorphism, matter and form. So the form being the person and the matter is the body or the individual. So I would like to keep it here, but I, my intention is just to show a kind of a, a history of idea, a kind of a background moving from the known to the unknown, from the familiar that is, that is common that we are, kind of infatuated with to what is not common that we have not heard a lot about. From the familiar to the unfamiliar that is not common to us, that is how I'm coming to African humanistic philosophy. And at this level, I would like to discuss African Igbo humanistics of person. And what am I talking about here? The idea of the person within the African world, precisely in Igbo humanities of the person, is the idea of being with others. It's a relational being. 
You cannot be without the other. So from the get-go, from the beginning, to be a human being is to be a relational being. It is a being that is anchored in the otherness. Without the other, I am not capable of being. The totality of my beingness is in with otherness. And the Igbo word that really comes out or encapsulates this understanding is ma'ado, ma'ado. I put it right here, ma'ado, the beauty of life. The beauty of life is in our conviviality. I am putting up a smile because you are there listening to me. That is the dialogical dimension of who we are. Maybe without you, I will be, you know, cranky, upset with existence. That the beauty of life is that we have each other's back. Even in Western philosophy, we talk about that. Someone like uh, uh, Martin Buber will have a similar thing like that. I and thou. And so I want to make sure that we see that there is already some similarities in African philosophy of person and some aspects of Western philosophy. So it's not totally something strange, but from colonial perspective, the voices of the African people in relation to philosophy of life, philosophy of person, philosophy of community is kind of clamped down, which I may call this, this perspective of uh, uh, epistemology of dominance, epistemology of colonization that doesn't allow the other to reveal his or her understanding of the world. Another point that I would like to underscore in relation to the evil concept of the person, not just the beauty of life, the person is part of Ihe. I put it right here, I-H-E. So there are two concepts here, I-H-E, the first one, reality, or you may call that M. K-P-I-M, the name of a person is that the person is the beauty of life, that the person is part of reality. Now, the other dimension of African Igbo understanding of the human being or the human person is Ihe with the two hyphens. I mean, this particular one right here, I-H-E. Isn't that interesting? The first one, I-H-E, in her thing, the essence of being. And then the other with hyphens, I-H-E is about light. The person is a being as well as light. I hope this may remind us about being and in, in African philosophy, as well as being the light. And this is associated with the idea, the light is that which discloses itself, just like in Western German philosophy, Dasein, isn't that interesting? The being that discloses itself. To be is to disclose yourself. To be a human being is to be beautiful. Whatever is beautiful is not hidden. When we acknowledge something beautiful, we are acknowledging the otherness of the other, the uniqueness of the other, and the capacity to interpersonal relationship. Because what is beautiful has evoked a sense of feeling in you, a sense of understanding, a sense of appreciation, a sense of human flourishing or fulfillment. Like we say, I love this person. It's because of this revelation, this disclosure, that emerges or emanates from that mado, the person. I will move this forward a little bit. In other words, I have briefly so put together a little bit of the distinction from this thinking self or the rational self that were the dominant philosophy of the person promoted by Rene Descartes, Immanuel Kant. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and even John Rawls in his own way, 
as well as Jacques Maritain that I articulated clearly today. So for us to really push this discussion forward, the person as the beauty of life, as a relational being, as light, has to be a relational being. In other words, we are talking about the person as an I, we, I am, because we are, and because we are, therefore I am. In Igbo philosophy, they call that Mado Ibe. The other is a piece and parcel of you, and you are the piece and parcel of the other. You can't dominate the other. You can't neglect the other. You can't isolate the other in order to be. I cannot be by diminishing your beingness because our beingness is interlocked, interconnected. And so this gives us this notion of African cosmopolitanism. And cosmopolitanism of brotherhood and sisterhood, just to simplify it. African cosmopolitanism of brotherhood and sisterhood. An Argentine Pope will call that Fratelli Tutti. Again, African philosophy is not totally strange, but we have to recognize that these are people in their own world, independent of the European philosophical thought, who have really developed their own reflections about life that I am committed so to say, to advance, to promote, and to kind of put together to preserve that scholarship. And that is what I'm doing today. Now, another way to look at this African cosmopolitanism, which is emerging from African communities of the person, you may call it cosmopolitanism, as well as the belongingness. It's a cosmopolitanism dash belongingness, to be together. You have a stake in my life, I have a stake in your life. It's not an existence of individuality by way of being individual. Remember, these distinctions I have to be very clear. We are not talking about individuality. That is uniqueness. That, that is present in the notion of the person. We are talking about individual, the person as a relational being as model is not the individual who is merely a thinking thought, a thinking self. It's much more than that. Because with the notion of the being an individual goes with the idea of political alienation. Me, myself, and I. I am intelligent. I am capable of reasoning. The other person is not capable of reasoning because reason is the measure of what it means to be a human being. Then it means that the person who is not capable of being a human being can be, so to say, dehumanized. Not The person is not really human. That is the idea there. So the person could be done away with. And this is why slavery was possible. This is why colonialism was possible because intellectually speaking, the West we are able to look at the other as the object, objectify the other, because the other, so to say, from their frame of mind is not capable of thinking. And so it's okay to dehumanize or to objectify, to make the person a beast, a burden, a manual laborer, maybe even the, the being to be insulted through conversion and through baptism and Christianization, or what some people will call to, to make the other person become human. So the Western philosophy through the agency of Christianity and intellectual or colonization of philosophy makes the other become like, become a Western person, become a thinking person. Now, the point I'm trying to put together here is I'm putting together African philosophy of cosmopolitanism, of brotherhood and sisterhood, or belongingness as against the background that gave us this political alienation. And this political alienation are expressed in some of the ideas of our world. I would like to hear emphasize uh, things that we may be familiar with 
the West and the American exceptionalism. It emerged from what I consider to be the political right that comes before the economic right. So to be a thinking being is to have a political right of self-determination, if I'm gonna put it that way, to be is to be political. To be is to be able to live in a state, to live in a society. If you remember someone like uh, uh, Thomas Hobbes, the idea of emergence of a society is about the individual right. From individual right, that someone else should not take away from you. Then you think about being in a community with the other where your right is promoted because human beings, especially within the Western philosophical tradition, human beings live to be a citizen, a citizen that has, so to say, membership or association with other people in order to form a society or a community. Like we may know this idea of political right is solely at the basis of what we understand from the Western philosophical narrative to be the idea of a human right, or what you may call the civil, political and civil right, which are the basis for much about the discussions we have about human right. Of course, there are other dimensions of human right like economic, social and cultural right, but they weren't the priority of Western philosophy. They were the priority most from the Eastern tradition. Which someone like uh, Makao Mutua would appendage African philosophy and African tradition. Now, the next point that I would like to emphasize is colonialism and Western civilization, the idea of universalism. I would like to make reference to the work of Muhammad Bedjoui, who was once uh, a judge and the uh, International Court of Justice, Den Haag, in the Kingdom of the Netherlands. He talks about what I call the GCEP. And what, what does that mean? Uh, the idea of the thinking self, the idea of this rational being that promoted the political philosophy of individualism or the Western understanding of the self was developed or advanced within the West through what Mohamed Bejoui calls the biases of the West. The first is a geographical bias. For you to be a human being, you have to be coming from this geographical space geographical location called Europe, associated with the Caucasus region of Georgia, so to say, which is this idea of whiteness. In order to be, you have to come from that space. Of course, it's not just the space. There is also this ability of people from that particular geographical location to carry their ideology or cultural worldviews to other parts of the world. And so this geographical location could be associated with what is going on today in America. So the America is the new world, is the new Europe. There is this culture of Eurocentricism. If you don't study in American university, you are not smart enough. If you don't teach in American university, you have not got it right. If a product doesn't come from American, or European world is not good enough. Remember, that was at the background of what I talked about that was used to antagonize the possibilities of African philosophy or diverse philosophies of the world because it wasn't coming from a particular geographical location, which is this idea of uh, exceptionalism, cultural exceptionalism, Eurocentricism the cultural space of the best of humanity, the cultural space of excellence. So that is part of this political alienation. This is part of this emphasis on me, myself, and I, this philosophy of person that promotes the individual as against cosmopolitanism and belongingness, brotherhood and sisterhood. Another point there is 
what I call they see, which is you may call that the civilization, you could also call it the culture, and you could also call it the, the, the Christianity, not just Christianity, but you could use it in inclusive sense, religion. So to be a human being, you have to come from this civilization of power, the civilization of the best of men and women, the civilization that is an intelligent intellectual civilization, the thinking thought civilization that must be universalized just like Immanuel Kant did in his deontological ethics. If you have to be a human being, then you have to have rationality. Without rationality, then you can't be a moral agent. You don't have the moral capacity. And so in this sense, this Western civilization pro was promoted through the agency of Christianity, which is why uh, I'm joking, but I'm making a point. This is why I de-emphasize my name, Stanley, because it's actually the Christian name, part of this dominance philosophy promoted through the agency of Catholicism, Christianity, and different forms of denominations in terms of uh, Christian tradition. You know, for you to be an African, then you have to let go about your African identity, African cultural understanding of yourself in order to borrow this something that is totally different, but you must put it on, just like putting on the white garment. So the white garment sanctifies you from your African barbarity. Your white garment puts you out there so that you become recognized clean. You know, whiteness is associated with morality and cleanness and decency and dignity, but any other color is not as good as. By the way, I don't identify as a black person, but this is an opportunity for reflections in the future. I identify myself as an African. To be African has nothing to do with coloration of like black, white, blue, red, and all that stuff. But I'm just trying to use that point because Christianity used that as such in terms of conversion, baptizing, making the African person to truly have a soul to be able to be saved by the Western culture and Christianity of salvation. Another point there is the economic mercantilism. You know, in order to promote the well being and the dominance, the colonial effect of Western philosophy, it was all about the business, the business of money. So, moving from political right to economic right because you can't really sustain political right without economic mandate. So you have to really, so to say, dominate the other. Like I discussed in the past here, the idea of colonization, colon, is to digest, to make the other disappear. So the other is not gonna be, so to say, a co-competitor in terms of business reflection or economic discussions. The other is more about to be dominated taken out of business, so to say, and he is or her resources taken away. And that is part of what impoverished from my political position, what impoverished a lot of African countries today, because this economic mercantilism took away not just the material resources, but the human resources, the intellectual capacity, which should have been at the pillars, which should be the pillars of African development, African progress. Now, the next point that I would like to talk about, which I would like to emphasize a little bit more on, is this, is this uh, political dominance is part of the bias of Europe, which is about dominance, which is about promoting the well-being of the European person, or which you may simply call Eurocentricism the European worldview about the self, the European worldview about the, uh, what you may call the, uh, the, the idea of citizenship, the European human rights and human well-being was how life was looked at. You cannot look at it any other way. And I hope if we want to read more about this, we could, uh, we could read uh, kind of my recent publications that I have called The Humanities of Person, belongingness and diverse philosophies. At some point in today's projection, I will show you the, the hard cover so that you can look at it for some references. But I would like to move forward 
uh, by way of the point I'm trying to underscore to another aspect called epistemological colonization or conceptual framework coming from the tradition of someone like South African philosopher Veli Mitover. She talks about epistemic decolonization, epistemic injustice. Pay attention to this point, it's very interesting. Colonization is just not taking the property that we have, it's also denying the people the capacity to think for themselves or even wipe the opportunity to think for themselves and make them use what you may call your own philosophy, epistemological colonization, their own educational process, their own pedagogical process, conceptual framework, whatever you have to use, it has to be within Western colonial categories or how the Western person thinks, but that is not really enough because every culture has a capacity to think for itself. Every community has a way of looking at life and reality. And that is what I'm trying to advance by way of this advancing African cosmopolitanism and the political philosophy of patriotism, where you have to love yourself. You don't have to alienate yourself because the history of thought has been more about alienation, control, and dominance. I would like to move this forward. So here, I would like to get into what I've called advancing, that is the actual having given a sense of the background to actual things that we can do or what we have been doing and what I'm doing as a person in order to promote African scholarship. The number one thing there is African political philosophy of cosmopolitanism, belongingness. They are already there. It is to call our young people and African scholars to step back from promoting Eurocentric philosophies and theologies and uh, studies and human beings, but to begin to return to the self. I think someone like uh, uh, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, the former president of Ghana, expressed this idea in his conscientism, conscientism returning to the self, or what you in your own tradition has called something that I really appreciate, the idea of conscientia critica, critical consciousness, begin to have a better understanding that you can't live a beautiful life hating yourself or be made to hate oneself. A critical life is about critical analysis, critical thinking. This, uh, uh, this really invokes in my consciousness the contribution of someone like Paulo Freire, the pedagogy of the oppressed in his work, he talks about conscientizazo, critical consciousness. I cannot be liberated by someone else. I need to liberate myself. I have to speak for myself. I have to develop who I am. I have to put who I am out there so that other people can hear my voice, which is the beautiful thing about philosophical humanetics, hearing the voice of the other, listening to the other, and being able to have a dialogue, to have a discussion so that the other is truly understood. In Swahili, and I love this very much, they call it Tuko Pamoja. We are together. It is something that the African person has to promote. The philosophy of Igwebike, that we are being that live in togetherness. We cannot afford to throw away our understanding of ourselves in order to totally embrace the Eurocentric project that has been you know, put out there. I'm not saying there are no positive dimensions to Western philosophy, of course, there are. Of course, when I was talking about Immanuel Kant today, there were great things that he said. Let's say the principle of universalizability, the principle of humanity, and the principle of autonomy, they are all great, but they were actually a promotion of Western way of looking at it. Even when he was talking about rationality, he was talking about the European person. Someone like Seni Serek Webeham pointed that out in what he called the Eurocentricism in the casework of Immanuel Kant. So it is well known fact that when Immanuel Kant was talking about this universalization rationality, he was talking about the European culture, European person within the European world and not every human being. But here, when I'm talking about African political philosophy of cosmopolitanism and belongingness, I'm talking about, so to say, not just America first, like we used to hear, is the African person recognizing himself. My voice matters. My philosophical world is important. Let's 
talk about it. Listen to me. Let me share my worldview. And this is what uh, uh, Hans Gilgadam has always called the fusion of horizon. Every culture, every people is talking from a point of view of the world. No particular culture has a totality of the view of the world. If we want to succeed, we have to recognize what the other is saying, which is the horizon or the perspective of the other and my own horizon or the other person's horizon that we have to put together in order to have a comprehensive understanding of reality. Now, the next thing there that I would like to talk about, just give me a moment. The next thing there that I would like to talk about is the other dimension called African political philosophy of patriotism. I have put together here this idea of Ujama, which is also idea of social brotherhood, social economy, social togetherness. Uh, someone like Leopold said a single will call it negritude, the attitude, this consciousness of self-appreciation, this part of intellectual conscientization, self-recognition, not self-destruction, not self-negligence. You always have to ask, what is in this for me? Is there any view that represents my position or my interest or my well-being? And you may also call that pedagogical agency. But essentially, my point is to emphasize that that aspect is actually political. Your, the political right to be, to exist, to shine, and to relate with the honor, other is at the basis of what human right is all about. And what do I mean by this political right? It is this, the political right to self-determination, the political right to self-regulation, and the political right to self-actualization. And there are two distinctions that I would like to make, important distinction. It's not just about self-determination because many African countries have self-determination by way of independence, but it's not enough. A lot of the countries are independent, but they are still promoting Western culture, Western philosophy, Western conceptual framework, Western concept of beauty, Western concept of education, and all whatnot. So we need to move from self-determination to self-actualization. And this is why this pedagogical process called African political philosophy of patriotism, we have to begin to be patriotic. We have to begin to appreciate one another. We have to be able to, you know, you know, hold the bull by its horn to face the challenges of life. I think I've said this before in one of my papers. I remember as a graduate student, it took forever to accept my work in African philosophy because a lot of the professors involved were like, oh, this is something strange. We have never heard about it. So I said, if there is European philosophy, they said yes. And so there is Jewish philosophy. They said yes. We have Chinese philosophy. They said yes. We have Japanese philosophy. So these are peoples and cultures of the world. So there should be African philosophy. There should be Igbo philosophy. There should be Yoruba philosophy. There should be any form of philosophy. Wherever there is a human being, there is a philosophy of life, a philosophy of relating to reality, appreciating reality, and understanding reality. I would like to move forward. Here, I would like to put everything together by way of summary and kind of conclusion. I have tried to develop this thought by moving from the notion of the person because the person is the basic unit of a community. Even though we started with the person, we still encourage ourselves with the tools of hermeneutics, which is the idea of dialogue, debate, discussion, public discussion about understanding our human diversities. I've tried to use this as a tool in order to help us move from what we are familiar with, which is this European Western philosophy about the person, about community, about right, about politics and all that stuff, to the idea of recognizing that the other has his or her own views that we have to pay attention to. And that is part of understanding that the other here has this philosophy of the self, the philosophy of person, that is not the philosophy of being an individual, but the philosophy of brotherhood and sisterhood. The philosophy of I am because we are, because we are therefore I am. It's a, it's a community-based philosophy. It is a philosophy 
that that of beingness and being together with and the philosophy of light and which could be part of the philosophy of hope of the future when we talk about them and so putting it together in order for us to really succeed in this cosmopolitan philosophy of belongingness we have to have this capacity of being patriotic of the pedagogy of the ethics of patriotism where you love yourself you appreciate yourself. You recognize, yes, the other has a message for you, but you cannot accept the message of the other by totally denigrating yourself, diminishing your humanity and your humanness in order to embrace these categories of the West or the categories of Europe, which is being promoted through the agency of Western capitalism, Western Christianity, Western civilization, or even this geographical dominance. Unless you buy the product from this particular space, you are not good enough. You are not gonna have a fulfilled life or a fulfilled existence. These are my submissions. And that is the message that I have in terms of promoting or advancing African cosmopolitanism and political philosophy of belongingness and well-being as well as patriotism. Thank you. Just give me a moment. I would like to uh, show the, the book cover, if I may. Perfect. It doesn't come on at the moment, but no problem. But this is what I would, I would just show you right here. So it's on Amazon. And so part of what I presented today is on uh, chapter six. In the future, I'll talk about chapter three as the case may be. Thank you so much, everyone. Gracias. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Stanley. Muchísimas gracias. Quisiéramos entonces eh, abrir la ronda de preguntas, comentarios, para entablar el diálogo. Ushi, I have, I have a, a question first. Okay. One question. Um, <clears throat> the new, if, if I, I could answer it, the new concept of the, of the real concept of person in Africa, um, overall in, in, the, in, in your geographical place, to, in your, your country, has to do with uh, the life with others in the sense that uh, the community is not, uh, is before the, the individual, yes. But uh, in, in the Western traditions, the um, fundament of the democracy is or are the different topics of the individual conception or the concept of, of individual, yeah. And um, also the, the topic of the human rights has to do in a very important sense with the individual. And um, in, 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 in this way, I ask you if the perspective, the Igbo perspective could, uh, help us to have another understanding of the democracy and also of the human rights. All right, thank you, uh, Carlos. Uh, if I understood your question, uh, you are asking that the, how we conceive the human person and community, which seems to be unique, how they could be related in terms of understanding human rights within the West or conception of human rights within the West as well as democracy. Mm. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I think it's very, uh, it's very pertinent to look at that. If you recall, 
uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights 1948 and some of the characters involved in the declaration or the draft of this Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is the basis of the corpus of human rights narrative. Uh, people like uh, Eliana Roosevelt, uh, Jacques Maritain played a role. These were core Europeans and Americans, you know, and how they look at life, that is how they use in drafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that we are all kind of signed on to. So it's like signing on to letting yourself go, like someone like, someone like me from Africa is letting myself go and trying to learn about the other without learning really enough about myself. And so when you look at this Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it's all about my right, my right, my right to this, my right to education, my right to property, you know, think about uh, John Locke, John Rawls. It's always this justice, right? But we have not really looked at our interpersonal relationship. Uh, like within the context of African people, we don't talk about right, right, this, right, car, my car, my television. It's all about our community. Unfortunately, colonialism and Christianity has really decimated the people from my own point of view, where you still have to pray to this uh, super powerful God in order to become powerful and at the same time dominate the other because you're always talking about yourself. But within the notion of personal community of the African person, which is also related with indigenous people, our beingness is interwoven, interconnected. I can't think about my property as against another person. It's all about this uh, community. Even in my lectures, I try to emphasize to students that the business of education is not about who is getting the A plus, A minus. We, have, we need to start talking about being the best versions of ourselves to flourish, to be a human being, to be educated, pedagogy, paideia, the development of the person, not about entitlement, not about right and all that stuff, which we are missing in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that we, so to say, in, in Africa and other parts of the world are being inundated or dominated with, as the case may be. So if we borrow some of the dimensions that I'm talking about in terms of the promotion of interpersonal relationship, Mado Ibe, I think we will really get along. Part of the problem is that the, because of uh, epistemic colonization, the African person is kind of intimidated to talk about the good thing that he or she has. Like I was actually intimidated by my form of education that I received because I felt like I've been shut down. You can't do this. You can't succeed. I said, no, this is what philosophy means for me to understand myself and to understand the worldview of my people, which gives me a lot about appreciating myself and appreciating the other and living in mutual relationship with them. This, I think, is important in current idea of uh, uh, promotion of democracy and current promotion of uh, the human right from a diverse perspective. One more point, someone like Makao Mutua has already put this point out there in his idea of human right, a political and cultural critique. So there he enunciated some of the points that I'm trying to communicate right now, that human right is no longer human right because it's about the West, it has to be an inclusive narrative, understanding of human right, which is relational beingness. Because um, if, if I think uh, that uh, normally the most common in the, in the practical use of the human right and the discourse of the human right in Western, I think Western also part of Latin America, overall Argentina. In the center of this the, the democracy, in, in, in the, uh, and in the center of the thinking of the human right is the individual, the individual, right. Right. not the community. Not the community, yes. Yeah, and for this reason, um, become the, 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 a, a lot of problem in the relationships of the community, because to, when we need to think uh, what we need, the, the, the right of the community, nobody want to accept 
this uh, topic as the more important than the individual rights. Yeah? Right. It is, I believe that in this sense, the, the, the way to, to understand uh, these topics in equal philosophy can help us to renew this point of view. And my, my second question is about the anchor of your thinking in this sense that um, the Western philosophy normally think about, uh, about you, the, the traditions, about the text of the uh, Western philosophy. Mm -hmm. In the uh, philosophy of the, the last uh, years in, in, in Western philosophy, for, for instance, also in the phenomenology, try to understand the reality uh, in some way um, without uh, thinking the philosophy without an interpretation of the tradition. But my question is, uh, when, you, when you think, when you produce um, African philosophy, where is, what is um, your, the, the, your anchor? Where is the language, is the practical uh, issues of the, of the people, is, what is it? It is both, uh, but even more so within humanetics or philosophical humanetics. Language is the abode of being. Being is understood through language, so it's mutually is, uh, inclusive. Without language, you can't really communicate reality, even though reality is not totally understood through language. And remember, when I'm using language, I'm using it in a very interesting sense, the inner word and the outer word. So like the English I'm speaking is only, so to say, like Gadam will talk about, it's only a physical language, but there is also an interior language that I'm using, which is in relation to understanding that sometimes we understand one another without having necessarily to understand a particular language the person is speaking. And so when I, if I'm speaking Spanish right now, you understand me, but you still understand the reality beyond the Spanishness in it, so to say. So, so that are the two points that I'm making there. So language and reality, they go together. They're mutually supportive. There is a symbiotic relationship to them. And so, for example, some of the concepts that I use in promoting African philosophy, Mado is Igbo. Igwebike is Igbo. Mado Ibe, the other is a piece and parcel of you, a part of you is Igbo. Even this idea of other culture using conscientizazo, it is that cultural way of expressing itself. For example, the idea of negritude, even though it's Francophonish, so to say, but at least it kind of comes from the perspective of someone like Leopold Sedesinger from Senegal, trying to go back home as much as possible to come so close to what can communicate the reality of his people. So I do think that uh, to, to put across the world philosophies of the African people, the indigenous languages must be promoted. Someone like Ngugi Wathiongo talked about that too, decolonizing the mind, the politics of language in African literature. And, and, and it's important that Africans are able to express themselves such a way that a European person could say, could you translate this into English language or maybe to Spanish or to French so that I can understand it or even let me challenge myself to learn your language in order to be able to understand your world as it should be. In this sense, there is a very real great pluralism because the, how many languages there, is, there are in, in Africa? A lot, yeah? I don't know what. In, and uh, each language is, is a, a point of view. Hmm? That, there's no problem with that because that is that is human beingness. It's almost like food, you know. 
-hmm. if you're in America, you could have hamburger, you could have French fries. No one is panicking about it. I'm here in America, I'm eating it, and life is going on. I'm dressing up like American. If I go home to tomorrow, I can put on my wrapper, as the case may be. Indians will put on their sari. So it's all about diversity. And it's not, it's, there could be a challenge, but it's not an impossibility, but the challenge yeah, yeah. is good because at the end of the day, it helps me to appreciate the uniqueness of the other, the diversity of the other, and not to overemphasize mine as if it, there is only one way to dressing up. There's only one way to feeding well. There's only one way to be a happy person and all, and all that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Emilia. Um, thank you very much for this wonderful lecture. And um, it really, I think, speaks to so many humanity skills. In a sense, it's about philosophy, but I think anybody working in in different areas of humanities can, can relate to, to what you say and, and the importance of what you say. Um, I have a lot of questions, but um, um, I wanted to, to ask one of them uh, because I had a sense that in, in, in a lot of what you say, kind of underlying principle is, I think what you are calling for ultimately is really a new understanding what philosophy is, not not, not just as an academic subject, but it needs to be understood differently as any subject, but as say, um, as something that isn't restricted to Western model, you know, as, as you were saying in the beginning, that um, rather than, for example, um, rejecting philosophy as ultimately Western concept, of course it is the, 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 in, in, that, in that world, in that world, uh, can't say this, that word is, uh, and its conceptualization as its functions now, but ultimately that um, the concept itself is, is changed to be far more accommodating of different um, structures, epistemologies, and, and even uses in a way, um, because a lot of what, um, what you describe um, can, can be then, you know, in a Western partition, kind of, sorry, in a Western tradition partitioned, let's say, a lot of what you talk about can be labeled, oh, this is anthropology, or this is sociology, and this is pedagogy, but you say, no, this is all philosophy. But ultimately, I think what you're calling for is, is the new meaning of philosophy. Could you, could you respond to it? Do I, do I understand you correctly? All right, thank you, Emilia. Um, yeah, when I say thought, I'm talking about logos, I'm talking about word. So, uh, you know, when you think about logos, you're talking about logic, which is about principles. So now you talk about principles in sociology, principles in philosophy as a discipline, principles in theology, but that the whole of it all is coming from the thought process, the conceptual framework, the categories of understanding, of the Western person, you know, for example, if you look at the works of uh, you know Paulo Freire and all the other scholars, they don't look at theology as maybe missiology perspective. They are now talking about liberation theology, which is not necessary within the framework of the West before now, so to say. Uh, so that is the same thing going on here. So there is there is a kind of a broad sense of the use of the concept of thought, as well as a, a narrow sense of the concept of thought. So in the broad sense, if we include all these disciplines, in a narrow sense, we are talking about the thinking process expressible in the various, uh, various disciplines in our various universities or interpersonal relationship with other people. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Amelia. Muchas gracias, Emilia. Muchas gracias, Stanley. Quisiera hacerte una consulta, Stanley, eh, retomando la, el planteo que hace Gadamer en un 
escrito titulado Hombre y lenguaje del año 66, pegadito a verdad y método, donde justamente inaugura ese texto diciendo que Logos se entendió en la cultura occidental o en la filosofía occidental como ser racional, es decir, como la racionalidad, y propone, plantea, retomar el término de logos o replantearlo como lenguaje. Es decir, eh, vuelve a traer a Humboldt a, a, a la discusión y entonces, eh, cuando él dice en ese escrito que ya de, de, digamos, sería el, el aspecto, es decir, hablar del lenguaje, en tanto es aquello que nos permite la, el comprender o la comprensión del mundo, estamos proponiendo una visión del mundo, como lo mencionaste vos, y no una concepción del mundo, universalmente válida o se rija universalmente, eh, me preguntaba cuando exponías el concepto del cosmopolitismo eh, africano, si eh, en la filosofía africana o en la producción filosófica africana eh, hay alguna consideración de ese, del logos o del ser humano, de la condición humana como ser eh, propio, es decir, como ser que se caracteriza por el logos en tanto lenguaje y no en tanto razón, eh, entendiéndolo como eh, visiones del mundo y no como concepción del mundo, es decir, como Welt an sich y no como la Welt anschauen. Entonces, sí, eh, hay en africanismo, haciendo eh, referencia a lo que se mencionó recién de la multi eh, multilingüe o digamos la multiplicidad de lenguaje no de lingüisticidad sino del lenguaje que hay en África si está eh, eso tematizado o planteado eh, en este concepto de cosmopolitismo en tanto sería como una suerte de primera interacción africana en la que se eh, en la que eh, convergieran o interactuaran las diferentes Welt und sich, estas diferentes visiones del mundo o si considerarías a la eh, digamos a, al ser humano a la condición humana africana como una unidad a pesar de esa diversidad de lenguajes, ¿no? de, de idiomas. All right. Thank you, Laura. Uh, I would like to begin with the last and then get back to the first as much as I can understand it. Uh, you are correct. Uh, has Gogadama is for me is a promoter of what I'm talking about. However, it doesn't end with him. It's like again this idea of moving from the known to the unknown, from the familiar to the unfamiliar. Remember when the story I gave you about my background when I was studying, and some of the professors were like, "We don't know what you're talking about." So I'm like, "Well, do you know this guy, Hans Gogadama?" I say, "Okay, you see what he's trying to say." that we have to listen to the voices of the other. We have to move, like you pointed out, from logos to language, because language will be the platform in order to communicate the reality or the vision, like you said, the reality or vision of reality by the other in relation to my uh, reality and uh, vision of reality. Now, the point I would like to take from there is that within the African world, language, human being, community, well-being, happiness, hope, they are all part of reality, constitutive of our world. So you can't really talk about language without, so to say, the content of language, because language is expresses thought, so to say. Language expresses what they are thinking. Without language, 
our thoughts may not be communicatable to the other person. There will be no sense of communion for the other, but we have it within us. And so this is where uh, what Heinz Gadamer is talking about is interest in logos as now to be understood as lingua or language. Another thing is that when we talk about logos, we have to be also generous, like I tried to explain with Emilia's question, we have to look at it also from a very broad sense, not merely from the abstract sense where oh, logos thought, reason alone, is also about accountability. So when I'm speaking, I am actually logically accounting for every word that I express so that there is, at the end of the day, meaning and meaningfulness. If there is no meaning and meaningfulness, then at the end of the day, that language is not, so to say, good enough, as the case may be. But you have to have the capacity to co comprehend that language in order to see dynamics or the dialectics and the meaning and the message that that language is capable of uh, putting across, as the case may be. But we have to recognize the right of that language, whatever language that is, in order to express itself in its diversity and its richness. Now, the other point that you raised that I think is very important is about vision, not just concept conceptualization. I think the point is clear that uh, conceptualization associated with the idea of ideas and concept uh, stays, so to say, at the level of abstraction. And so uh, Hans Gyogadama is trying to promote a kind of a contextual philosophy, something that is uh, concrete, something that is relatable, something that you can feel and touch. And so I will call that as a philosophy of encounter. We experience things, we'll have the visions of things, that's okay, but for human beings, we have to have the encounter with human beings, such a way that assuming that if I say something, even if I say it in Spanish and I didn't say it very well, uh, Carlos is able to understand me, Laura is able to understand because you're like, oh, I get what you're trying to say. So you're like, my Spanish is not good, but the inner meaning of what I'm trying to say is communicable to you at the same time. So that is the encounter that goes beyond language. I remember some years ago when I first came to Canada, uh, some people would be like, hey, I can't understand this other guy. I can't understand this other guy. I said, hey, calm down. You have to relate with the person as a fellow human being in order to understand even with the person's accent. But when you are like, oh, I don't understand you, you're already alienating the person because you don't care about the effort the person is making from having a particular language before moving to an English speaking country in order to speak that particular language with you. So it is no longer merely linguistic conceptualization, exactitude. It is now about appreciating encountering the other and being able to dialogue. And remember, there's something about dialogue. Dialogue is not something that happens once. It's something, it's a continuity, it's a continuum. What I said today, you could think about it tomorrow and then have a better understanding of it. And so it is an ongoing process. And that is the beautiful thing that Hans Georg Gadama is trying to promote by moving logos to make it become lingua or language. Gracias, Stanley. Muchas gracias. Sí, Santiago. Sí, sí. Uh, thank you, Stanley, so much. It's a pleasure to hear you again and think with you. I have actually like a question and like kind of two questions. One, that I'm not sure because um, my son just left and it was just so much noise around. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure if I, if I got it right. And then, and then um, I guess they're, they're, they're part of the same question. Uh, at a certain point in the development of, of, of your thought, uh, you were saying something that 
came from this beingness interlocked, right? If I understand correctly, there's something prior to um, consciousness. Uh, there's something prior to any epistemological um, definition of the human being. That's why I guess you started with Descartes and then Kant to say, well, there's something in the, in the being that comes before and design, no? And at a certain point, you um, talked about the Gadamerian idea of um, fusion of horizon. And you said something like the comprehension of the other. Um, and I always have a problem with this, with, uh, this idea that, and I guess you were talking about this with, um, Laura's question to a certain extent that we are actually able to understand the other. Lo perdi. Oh, there you are. Um, and there is, there is, there is a notion um, in the epistemological level, which is um, Husserlian, right? This idea that we can empathize, right? Uh, I'm feeling, no? We can empathize with the other. There, there's a possibility of understanding um, the other. But to, in, at the level of being, it's harder to understand, well, comprehend or um, empathize. And now in Argentina, I don't know in Canada but or Africa, but here there's this whole movement of empathy. We have to be em em empath empathetic and I, I, I can't see it possible um I, I i i can't understand that possibility in uh interlocked beingness um there is something impossible of putting myself in the place of the other there's something irreplaceable about anyone but um I remember Carlos told me once uh, that my son was was having a really really tough time, and he and he said he said we can't we can't uh, replace take their suffering of our children. We can't, we can't, and even as fathers, that's the only thing we want to replace his suffering and suffer in his place. But there is no way, even when a friend is suffering and you're like well i want to feel like he is feeling well you can't i feel at a at a level we, we we might be able to consciously understand something but there is no way to put yourself in the other's place right um i guess that's it i don't want to monopolize the the what, what, what are your thoughts on, on the status in, in your thinking of, of empathy and, 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 and how does this uh, resolve in, in, in your thinking? All right, thank you, Santiago. Okay. Uh, by the way, your question kind of reminded me what recently happened in Argentina, and I hope I'm correct, about the assassination attempt on uh, Christina Kirchner, as the case may be. So I felt so to say, concerned, empathetic about the experience, even though uh, there's an expectation for her to go through the legal system and situations, the political system in Argentina. Now, the point I'm trying to underscore by that is that we have to pay attention to this uh, epistemic colonization and this idea of epistemic decolonization that I made reference to in terms of the contributions of someone like uh, Veli Mitinova, as the case in Mitova, as the case may be, and also the contributions that I made. 
we can't say something is impossible just because we are coming from a particular linguistic tradition. Maybe it's impossible in a particular linguistic tradition does not necessarily mean that it is impossible in another word. And so uh, in order to, when we encounter the other, we are capable of empathizing, sympathizing with the other. We're able to do a lot of things that maybe within the Anglo-sized linguistic tradition is like non-existent. Remember, there was a kind of characterization that I associated with Western philosophy, which is like the idea of abstraction. You know, like, it's like the feeling is not there. To have feeling is a sign of weakness or oh, even in Aristotelian philosophy is pathos. Pathos is like to be deceased and, you know, is something a rational being cannot do. Maybe this is why in Immanuel Kant's tradition, uh, you know, kids are not, uh, they are not rational beings, so they have no moral agency. Someone who has Alzheimer's disease or maybe incapacitated in some way uh, cannot think, you know, so feeling, is like denigrated. Even some people say this, that men don't cry, which means it means that you have to be a no man in order to have that empathetic, sympathetic feeling dispositions in you. Again, these are the world views of Europe that has been dominant in the epistemic traditions of our world. We are not saying that they are totally wrong. We are only saying that within the context of philosophical hermeneutics that one has to be open-minded to listen to other traditions and see how they communicate the content of their world and the appreciation of their world. So when I use the concept of comprehension of the other, I mean encountering the other, not merely experiencing the other. Because when you experience the other, you wouldn't be able to feel what they feel, be part of their journey. And then there is an Igbo word that I used here today, Madu Ibe, Madu being the beauty of life. Then the, the exciting thing about the beauty of life is that you realize and you are able to show the other person that I feel with you. I know what you are going through. Even if you have your own uniqueness, that is part of accompaniment in the journey of life. And so I do think that African philosophy, Igbo philosophy, indigenous philosophy has something more in terms of emphasizing empathy and sympathy as the case may be. But I'm almost, I'm not saying that it is exclusive because if you read the work of Martin Buber, you will see that. If you read Emmanuel Levinas, in the idea of our three otherness of the other, you will really see that in Gabriel Marcel, they are already there, but they were not really promoted or advanced by a lot of uh, Western philosophers. Much about it is strictly in the tradition of uh, Rene Descartes, Immanuel Kant, or even the guy that I mentioned, uh, Jacques Maritain and the rest of them. So again, within African philosophical world, as well as the indigenous philosophy, our relationship with one another is, uh, is a constitutive world that we are able to feel what the other is feeling. We are not merely thinking it. Another point that I'll have to make before I end is like, for instance, in Western philosophy, when you think about the person, you think about the, the soul and the body. In African philosophy, it's much more than the soul and body duality. There is the body, there is the soul, there is the spirit, there is the consciousness, there is the, the light, there is also even hope as part of the beingness of the person. Great, if I may, just one, one more thing. Um, the beauty of life, I think, um, I think the, uh, the reference could be uh, like a Kantian um, in the fa uh, faculty, uh, la faculty of, of judgment, I guess, the, uh, la, la, the third um, critique, because 
um, in his definition of beauty, there's something subjective and universal at the same time. So that, that is that the idea that um, uh, each one has a different idea of beauty, but we all understand that is beautiful. What is beautiful, even though each one of us have a different idea. Is that is that what what you're thinking about? Yeah, I mean, there's idea of the sublime too, you know, but the point there is, uh, yeah, the beauty has to go with excellence. The beauty has to go with human flourishing. The beauty has to go with fulfillment. Uh, I'm joking, it's not about the the beautiful lady and the, be the handsome man kind of stuff, you know, but the order in the world and the meaningfulness that is present in the world, that is the beauty there. Uji, two questions. First, uh, what is the place of the literature in your work, the African literature in your work? And second, um, the, um, the terminology that they use is the Western terminology of philosophy. My question is, um, the contribution of the, the African philosophy may be also a, a, new, a, a new way of terms or the new terms, the, the, the terms in, the, in, the, in your own languages, because we, the translation is the, I mean that finally we, we, we finished uh, speaking in the Western languages and in this sense we lost uh, the, the, a lot of content or the contribution of the uh, Africans thinking. Uh, for instance, in, in Spanish, when we try to understand uh, Heidegger, or that we we can to we try to understand Gadamer, uh, sometimes we use the German uh, words, and uh, I, I believe that uh, we need to incorporate also the African languages to to have an another other a view of the, the, the person, of the world, of the reality, and uh, so to have the possibility to, to renew our way of thinking. Thank you, Carlos. Yeah. Yeah, like I did, I, I got what you said. I did that also in my work. I introduced a lot of uh, African Igbo concepts, like the yes. one that I mentioned, Ihe, I-H-E, and the Ihe, so the, the Ihe in Igbo is light. So if you want to, if one is interested in African philosophy, you, or Igbo philosophy, you get to hear the word that we have for, for, for light and the word we have for being. And I remember as a young philosopher, my professor also continued, started with that tradition, Pantelion Irebu, he calls the quim, the essence, the quit essence of a thing. That's what philosophy goes for, according to him. I'm also trying to avoid merely transliteration. You know, I hear what Europeans say and I translate. It, it has to come with concepts that are truly indigenous even though without really locking ourselves in isolation where, because philosophy is not to lock oneself in isolation, it's dialogical by its nature, it's dialectical, you listen to the other, improve yourself, it's about cultural being as the case may be. Yeah, another thing is like uh, Ngugi Wathiongo uh, has always done a great job in that regard, he wrote a number of works like Weep Not Chai and then Decolonizing the Mind, uh, the Politics of Language in African Literature, and so he talks about, he suggested that African writers should probably choose some common uh, language like Swahili to write, you know, 
to like write their literature so that when someone is really interested, you'll be talking about let's translate from, uh, from African language to, to English language or to Spanish or to French. And I've also done that in my work as the case may be, which is why, what, I, what part of what I'm doing now by putting together African scholarship and making it possible that proverbs, African proverbs could be expressible in African words and then there'll be a translation, not a transliteration like this word for word, but the meaning, the message, which is the essence of hermeneutics, the meaning and the message. Uh, this, this is a joke, but it's an interesting part of it. That is why I encourage people to call me Uche, because if you go to Boston College and you, you say you are looking for Professor Stanley, and my students will not know. You see, there's a kind of progress. Maybe some years ago, they were calling me Professor Stanley. Now, when they write Uche, I'm all excited. It's all a gradual process. Again, moving from the known to the unknown. Uh, the effort in terms of using African language in order to communicate African worldviews and philosophy is not going to be a reactionary, antagonistic, and fighting. It's about a revolutionary attitude, a dialogical attitude, and a project based on with a sense of humanity, with a sense of responsibility and encounter that we have to have for one another. And so this is what we are doing. And that I think is the right thing to do. And in, in this sense, we, we need to decolonize the, the term philosophy. Right, of because, course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you could use oku, you could use ihe, because if you say philosophy, I mean, narrow it down to the etymology of the Greeks, philosophia, lover of wisdom, which I now talk about as lover of truth, lover of knowledge, then the Igbo word there is oku, ihe. Uh, the person who would like to understand the truth or the reality. And I think in a lot of indigenous tradition, they have this idea of philosophy to mean this, the person who a seeker of knowledge, a seeker of truth, not just wisdom, but a seeker of knowledge. And, and even in African philosophy, we have people who specialize, so to say, in holding the tradition of the truth. And so we call them So if I hold something like this, it's a wooden object, you know that I promote truth, I promote wisdom, I promote knowledge, which makes me a philosopher in that situation. It's also a sign for justice as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Uche. Welcome, Mark. Si alguien, eh, tenemos dos o tres minutos más, si alguien quiere hacer todavía alguna consulta, algún comentario. En tu eh, nombre de, de Zoom, eh, nos falta el Uche. <ríe> Así que ese podemos agregarlo para la próxima y para seguir promoviendo justamente la comprensión desde, eh, <ríe> desde la terminología de africana, Correct. la occidental, la filosofía Correct. occidental. Así que la I have a question. Eh, en ambas direcciones, como decimos, en traducción que sea viceversa. Sorry, I have a question for Emilia and uh, Ushe, both. Emilia, Emilia is, to, she is studying medieval history and teach medieval history in England. And she is now in England and lives okay. in her in a beautiful house. Uh, Emilia, what's mean 
in the studies of uh, in, the, in the in the in the area of um, medieval study, what's mean a possibility to study the medieval uh, time in Africa? That's a, it's a very timely question because um, there is for at least 10 years, maybe longer, a new concept called global middle ages. And it means all sorts of things, but it, it, it's also connected to a lot of things that Professor Uche was um, telling us. Um, it's in part also linked to the concept of decolonizing history, um, making it more inclusive, but also this more fundamental um, epistemic shift, also possibility of other epistemological systems. And, and things, for example, what is archive? Um, so fundamental concept in, in Western history um, be also broadened to include different concepts of archives, for example. But um, exactly uh, what is, um, because if, if we think about the global Middle Ages, the first thing, okay, is, does medieval is a concept that can be, um, that can be applied to non-Europe non or even to Eurasia, uh, let's say, um, not just Europe, but Asia, which is in pre-modern period very connected to Europe or Europe connected to it rather. Um, but does it work in other regions of the world before the time when U Europeans became colonizers or even contact? Um, a very good example which, um, so I don't want to go into big lecture, but there are different ways that people try to do this global middle ages. It's about, uh, for example, studying how Europe was connected or not to the, uh, to the um, um, rest of the world or making comparative studies. So you take one phenomenon in medieval Europe or elsewhere and compare. So for example, from my field, studies comparing Latin monasticism and, and Buddhism in the pre-modern uh, period, for example, in, um, in well, not specific kinds of uh, Buddhist monasticism. But it can be also, people sometimes understand the global Middle Ages simply um, not, um, simply studying uh, this time period, sometimes called differently, in not, not in Europe to, to make um, pre-modern history not only about Europe. And the big implication of that is, is the kind of shifts. They are occurring very, very slowly to different understanding what is medieval Europe or what is medieval. Uh, and there are some really interesting uh, works. And I just want to show one, um, one example. I put it in the... Um, in the slide, an example of a book, um, which I think, so not in a slide, in, in a chat, um, that is, um, I think, one of the most fruitful and important um, um, types of uh, global Middle Ages by Verena Krebs, who is a, a German medievalist, but she works on medieval Ethiopia. And this is, this is the book, it's based on her PhD. And this is basically, this is telling about from Ethiopian perspective, she also studied in Ethiopia. And so she, she it's not, um, because the problem is when, when Western scholars start working on non-European Middle Ages without knowledge of language. I mean, this is hideous and this sort of colonial bullshit. I'm sorry to be vulgar, but her book is nothing like that. It's really excellent. It's about, it, it's a, it's about the contact of Ethiopia with uh, with Europe, but told from Ethiopian perspective, and I think this is this is an example how how the global Middle Ages makes sense. Sorry, I was talking for quite a long time, but I hope it was a useful answer. I, thank you so much, Amelia. I mean, this is the beauty of humanetics: is you know everyone has something to contribute. We learn from one another. It's an inclusive world. Uh, it's a world of diversity and inclusivity. Uh, to complement your comment or contribution, you know, 
based on the question by Carlos, you know, even within the African philosophical world, you know, the calculation of dates and time and history and space may not necessarily be the same, you know, like what makes an ancient, ancient philosophical or traditional, what makes a medieval, what time and the modern and the contemporary, you know, some, sometimes I give lectures to friends in, in Iran and they are celebrating a particular time of the year, totally different from the Labor Day weekend we have in the United States. You know, you have the, the year of the pig, the year of the monkey and all that stuff. So uh, what I may put together here is that what is important is that uh, we begin with what is available within the African world. And because based on colonization, it wasn't just the destruction of uh, human resources. There were also destruction of intellectual resources uh, that put Africa within the, the dark age, as the case may be, where you didn't have any reference point. Of course, as we may know, uh, not just in Western philosophy, that or European philosophy where uh, maybe Plato, Aristotle, all these people didn't do a lot of writing, but their disciples or students did because they, they wanted to preserve word itself or logos. It's the same thing within the African world. People wrote, but they were so much interested in, in this communicative tradition, tradasio, where you pass something on verbally as well as write as much as possible because the importance is on understanding. I'm hoping that by our contributions, well, in terms of scholarship, there'll be a kind of preservation of what we can write now and then be able to go back in time. There is a work by Innocent Onyewenyi, I think is very interesting. I read it when I was a young uh, philosopher student the African origin of Greek philosophy. Uh, that may sound controversial, African origin of Greek philosophy. So if you can trace an African origin of Greek philosophy, and then you, that means that having medieval narratives and probably modern philosophy could have something to go with how Africa has contributed in the roles of philosophy. I think there's another guy, William Amo in Germany, who really did a lot of work, an African guy uh, who did a lot of work promoting philosophy that you don't hear a lot in German philosophy. So these characters are important if we want to build narratives in terms of ancient African philosophy, medieval contributions of African philosophy, modern and then contemporary. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Carlos, querías agregar algo más? No, no. Entonces, un agradecimiento, Uche, eh, por esta conversación que da lugar a, justamente a la interacción entre paradigmas y entre culturas. <ríe> eh, Queremos agradecer a todas y a todos los que asistieron y por supuesto invitarlos a que compartan las grabaciones con quienes no hayan podido venir por una cuestión horaria quizá que, eh, que luego bueno, se puede suplir con, con el disfrute de la conversación eh, en forma diferida. Nos volvemos a encontrar en diciembre, Uche, y te queremos agradecer enormemente tu generosidad, tu eh, disposición eh, de escucha también. Y, y bueno, eh, Carlos, eh, no sé si quieres decir chao todavía, eh, y cerramos la, la reunión así con un agradecimiento y una, gran, eh, y una gran alegría de poder hacer estas reuniones, ¿no?
solo agradecer a Ushi y, y a todos los que participaron, a todos los que van a ver este video luego, esta grabación, y seguiremos insistiendo en nuestro esfuerzo por entablar un diálogo con, con África. Sí. Gracias a Dios tenemos un puente hoy que es Sushi. Y bueno, iremos este, construyendo una autopista África-Argentina. A ver si nos... Eh, si, si África nos ayuda a entendernos mejor a nosotros mismos. Que ese es el objetivo. ¿no? Solo cuando entendemos a otros, en el esfuerzo de entendernos a otros, eso es finalmente lo que viene a decir Gadamer, en el esfuerzo de entendernos a otros, está la posibilidad de entendernos a nosotros mismos. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Uji. Thank you. Thank you very much. You remain in contact, yes? Muchas gracias. Thank you. Gracias, maestro. Yeah.